Um, today we're going to be again taking our journey through our ecclesiastical calendar um, that started on September 1st and now we've made our way all the way actually to November. We skipped a couple months but not because intentionally, it's because there aren't, let's say, the major feasts that we're talking about related to the Baniyya and to Christ. Um, so the next one is a fixed date of November 21st and that is the presentation of the Theotokos to the Temple which I don't want to be confused, I don't want people to be confused with the presentation of Christ to the temple. It's actually, let's say, two different presentations. Um, Christ's presentation to the temple is quite literally, is Christmas Day and then 40 days afterwards, so February 2nd. Now this one, we celebrated the nativity of the Theotokos back in September. So now we're all the way to November. Get it? The 40 days blessing. One is obviously of the 40 day blessing and then the other one is actually just the presentation of the Theotokos to the temple. So why would she be presented, let's say, in a different manner? Well, she wouldn't. She probably did have her 40 day blessing, but we don't have, let's say, a whole life story. Um, we have from the book of James, um, pinpoints of time throughout the history and we hear that there, she was presented to the temple after X amount of time. I believe she was uh, three, four years old when she was presented to the temple, but that was for her life. So her parents decided that when they, they were gonna fulfill the, let's say, the obligation that they had made to present her to the temple. Um, again, that happened around three to four years old. And that's what this presentation was all about. And so, actually, yes, it was three years old. Joachim and Anna decided the time had come fulfilled, the promise to offer her to the Lord. And when she had arrived, there was actually a procession that was made from their home to the temple. And when, she came to, when it came time to come to the gates of the temple, she actually ran towards the temple. And she said, forget the, forget the procession. And she ran towards the temple and ran to the high priest of Zacharias, who was waiting for her at the gate of the temple with the other elders. And Zacharias gave her a blessing, and I include it in here. It is in you that he has glorified your name in every generation. It is in you that he will reveal the redemption that he has prepared for his people in the last days. So then what happened was is she was brought from, if you think about how we said in church architecture, our church is being similar to the ancient Jewish temples, went from the front where that blessing had occurred, come down to the middle, and actually took her to the holiest of holies took her into the altar, which would be related to our altar. Um, back then, the Holiest of Holies was reserved for merely just the one time per year, which was the Day of Atonement. And he placed her on the steps of the altar, and the grace of the Lord descended upon her, and she, le and she lived in the temple and dwelt among the temple, did all of the obligations of the temple until she was a teenager. Um, and then she was able to leave as she became betrothed to Joseph. Um, and then the rest is history. Um, so that is merely the feast day of, that we're commemorating on November 21st and that it shows the dedication of the Theotokos throughout her whole life. But even from when, before she was born, when her parents were giving, let's say, all of these praises to God and offerings to God to be able to have a child and then came the Theotokos. And so it was time to fulfill their promise and present her to the temple. So again, it is different than like the 40 day presentation uh, that we hear with Christ. Yes. Yes, so actually the father of St. John the Baptist was, well, yeah, they were a family, yes. Good question trying to learn the lineages. It's like learning the lineages of Tarpon Springs. You're never really gonna get it, right? Everyone's related somehow in some way. If you look hard enough, it's, it's there. But just like, but it shows importance, you know, when you think of a Christmas day, right? The gospel reading for Christmas is a long list of names, but it's important to know the genealogies. It's important to know even where us, where we come from. One of the biggest things these days are like those, uh, whatchamacallit, the genetic testings, the 23andMe, the Ancestry.com. It's important to know where we come from and what areas. I mean, it's nice to know. You don't have to do them, but I'm just saying it's a thing these days to, to learn where they have come from um, within their DNA and so on and so forth. But, but then it also shows an importance to us, especially on Christmas Day, 
Why is it important to know Christ's lineage? It's important to know Christ's lineage because the, he is fulfilling the prophecies. In the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew is writing directly towards the Jewish people and is essentially showing them Christ is fulfilling all these prophecies. He is the true Messiah. And as the Jewish people believe that the Messiah is to come from the line of King David, and even from beforehand, it even goes before then, but within the lineage that we hear on Christmas Day, you hear David the king, and then you hear Jesse, you hear of some of these very important people within, let's say, the genealogies, and they're all there to fulfill that prophecy of Christ coming from these genealogies. So it's important. So it's, it's a good thing that a point that you brought up about, you know, who she was related to and so on, it was her uncle and whatnot. Um, so wonderful question. Are there any other questions, let's say, according to the feast? If not, we have some extra minutes for some extra questions. Um, anything? Yes? Um, if Mary was taken to the temple, then how come Joseph was, um, wasn't aware that, that she was going to play that role? Why wasn't Joseph aware? Well, so the presentation happened when she was three years old. Joseph wasn't in the picture, let's say. But then she came out of the temple and then... Correct, and she was betrothed. Yeah. I, that's a wonderful question. I, there's no, let's say, documentation of him knowing or not knowing. But you have to also think, even in the iconography, that there is an element of doubt in Joseph as his betrothed wife um, being bearing a son that, let's say, wasn't consummated. Um, so that confusion and that doubt leads to believe that there's an element of him not knowing, um, but eventually he believed. Yes. She was 13 years old, correct. She was a teenager at that point. Why did they say she was a marriageable age? A marriageable age, good question. Well, back then, that was a marriageable age. Things are a little bit different these days, right? People don't get married until later on in life. Back then, you also have to think life expectancy. Life expectancy, life expectancy back then, was probably in the 30s or 40s. It wasn't actually very long. Um, part of the reason why the 40-day blessing, for example, occurs is because there's a lot of things that happen within the 40 days, one for the mother, but also for the child. And many children and mothers actually wouldn't make it out of those 40 day, that 40-day period. And the dedication to the temple was them giving thanks for them, let's say, getting out of that 40-day period. I'm answering your question, don't worry. And so on. But so 13 years old, that was a marriageable age, let's say back then. Yes. Was that because she became a woman at 13? Is that right? Correct. Usually that's around the time that, just like how they have their bar bat mitzvahs in the Jewish faith, they, then when they enter into adulthood, that is the, approximately that time. What do you mean? They wouldn't let her into the temple. No, they would, just that, no, the point is, is for her specifically, she was to be dedicated to the temple. Her parents, let's say, made a promise, a dama almost, of if I am to bear a child, I will bring her and dedicate her to the temple in, let's say, a stronger way than like the typical dedication, okay? She was to actually live, they had promised her to live at the temple. And that's why that promise was fulfilled. So she was, let's say, different than, she was like the people that are like caretakers of the temple. And she was working in the temple, doing the obligations of Zacharias and all of the other priests and so on, and the clergymen. Um, and then, of course, at that time, they would either stay there for the rest of their lives and take like an oath of celibacy or to be betrothed. Good questions. Doozies, you're lucky I read up on this beforehand or else I would have a lot of, well, let me get back to you on that one. Um, anything else? Any questions in general? We got, a, I think, a couple minutes. Oh, we got plenty of time, even better. Oh, even better. We got 10 minutes. Or we don't have 10 minutes and we'll just have some time for prayer. If, seeing no qu question, not question. Sure. What it, what it was? 
Well, it was a pool. So outside of, so outside of the gates of many cities, there, there would be a pool a sh where they would cleanse, let's say, their feet. They would cleanse animals. At that point, it was to cleanse the animals for sacrifice. And that was what those pools possessed. And then for other, let's say, other pools, there would be pools that were there for cleansing. As you hear, when they were healing the paralytic, they were next to a, an area of water, and the, the pool would essentially be, would be turned around, and then the people would jump in. So pools played many different, let's say, roles. Um, specifically, that one I'll have to do some research on. Um, but mostly that's what they were there for, was for the cleansing of sacrifices and healing. Correct. Golimvita, for example, is like a baptismal font, even. So it's a, it's so many of the pools, and you'll see many of the miracles that ex that happen there. Many of them, let's say, there's an element of healing um, to kind of let's say dictate the notion of the old self to the new self, and then that cleansing action, sign of like repentance, metania, and so on. Like it, you have that element of repentance, that transition, that transformation of the heart of the person to be able to then move on to, let's say, a new self. So just like how we have baptisms and we put them into the Kolin Vitra, they, we take the old Adam, the old self, and into the new Adam, into the resurrectional Christ. Thank you. Good questions. Yes. Well, Zacharias was her uncle, so he was also a high clergyman. Um, some people at, would see the high clergyman almost as, as prophets, wasn't designated as a prophet. Um, but, you know, how she would have this role is more so this specific date is commemorating merely the presentation. Let's say not the acceptance of call. But we know her from the beginning of her life, living a holy life, and it starts really here in the sense of the ages of where she was able to be presented to the temple. So this is kind of that formative time where, that she's having where we would go into those transitions. Um, so like, for example, that, let's say that message from Archangel Gabriel hasn't actually happened yet. Um, that happened later on. Um, so let's say some things had to happen first before we get to that pivotal moment. Um, from there. That was a great question, for example, at the Annunciation. At the Annunciation, so when we get to March 25th, um, the perfect nine months before Christmas, that will be a wonderful question that, you know, I'll make sure to, to put into the reasons uh, why we celebrate the feast. What other questions? We had some good ones. That was nice. Good job. I'm